And I still don't even know how to like really handle that, you know, because I at least thought at one point when he was sleeping, I thought that, you know, he got that like that break. But it's hard. She still uh, blamed herself. In 2016, Griffin Albritton's parents were ecstatic to bring their second child into the world. His mom, Michelle, had an easygoing pregnancy with a scheduled C-section. When Griffin was born, they instantly knew something was wrong. As time went by after several hospital stays, doctor visits, and new diagnoses, they realized he not only is a rare case they had never seen, but he had polymicrogyra and heterotopia and epilepsy and more. In his four years of life, they have tried everything and nothing has seemed to work for him. They just got the unfortunate news that they have three to six months left with their baby boy. This is the story of Griffin Al Britton. Uh, it took us actually seven years uh, to have our first child, so we didn't think that we could get pregnant. Um, so uh, it was a shock when we found out that we were pregnant for a second time. Um, and it was kind of just like out of nowhere. Um, I wasn't feeling good one day and I wound up going to the hospital and I came out and handed papers to Alan and I was like, so I'm pregnant. Like, and he was like, oh my goodness, you know, cause we were really excited. Kind of at that time, we also made the decision to move back to Kansas cause we wanted to be closer to our families. I was like four months, three or four months pregnant. We just kind of packed up everything that we owned and moved back to Kansas yeah, we, and- We drove the whole way. Yeah, <laughs> that was. Like in an SUV that was literally crammed from Florida route. Yeah, like we're packed full. Yeah. So when we moved to Kansas, I started seeing um, our doctor, and I mean, everything from there, like they said, on that side was good. Heartbeat was great. Um, yeah, sonograms looked normal. Yeah. You know, everything was. We didn't smooth. have, we weren't expecting any trouble. Yeah. I could tell Alan throughout the pregnancy, um, I don't know, after we moved to Kansas, I just had like this feeling that. Griffin was going to be our special baby and I would tell that to him and he would get <laughs> he would get kind of frustrated and be like why are you saying that you know you're jinxing and I was like I don't know I just have like this this feeling that you know Griffin is going to be special um and I had even gone as far as to ask the doctor to do more sonograms because I just felt <clears throat> I don't know why I just felt something yeah was different and there, you know, she was like, everything is great. We don't see any issues. You guys took seven years to get pregnant and then just got pregnant like that. Yes. Yeah. So then you go into labor. Yes. It was a scheduled C-section. He was at 39 weeks and kind of right away, Alan kind of felt something you know, was off during that because the, the doctor seemed to be kind of struggling, you know, even just to get Griffin out, like with the C-section. I, I could tell right off that something was wrong. Yeah. Like as they were getting the baby out. Like right. you could just tell like the energy in the room was low, tense, and you could just kind of, you know, obviously there were the surgical masks in there, um, but just in their eyes, you could tell that like people were starting to get worried the doctor was starting to get worried, the, the midwife um, and nurses that are in the room. You can just kind of tell that they were all kind of silently communicating something to each other through their eyes. And it sounds silly, but just literally the energy in the room did not feel right for yeah, what yeah. should be a really happy, joyous occasion of a new person coming into the world. Generally, they're all ecstatic and happy to welcome the new person. So um, we, I started catching on to that pretty quick and then eventually, um, more or less they had to admit what was going on. Yeah. He came out and was just like. He was super floppy. I mean, well, yeah, just like. He, he just dead weight and like, I was really worried that he didn't, you know, he didn't make it. Like it was really emotional. That's what I was gonna ask. Like, yeah. did he scream and were you, could you take a deep breath when you found out, okay, the baby's alive? Right, he, he let out a little, a little cry. He made out. Yeah, you know, it was like a squeak though. Right. I, that's how we knew something was yeah. way off. 
I mean, they instantly had to put him on oxygen. Right, so he went right to the little baby bed. Right, and they weighed him. There was three nurses over there, and you could just see him frantically, like, suctioning and getting yeah. the oxygen mask on and then suctioning more out and trying to figure out why his stats weren't coming up and stuff. Right. Um, so that's kind of how it started, you know. We, it was a very traumatic Yeah, experience. and I mean, you know, for me, like, I didn't know what was going on, obviously, because I had a C-section, you know, so I couldn't see anything. Well, yeah, initially they took him, they're like, hey, we got to take him and yeah. we got to work on him and we don't want anybody around for that. So um, they're like, you know, we know, like, we're just, we need to be able to focus on what we're doing. So they basically put us in a room and uh, we were just sitting there not knowing and it was crazy. It was just a crazy, like, because we were... You know, start off the day, we were happy. Yeah, like, I mean, uh, we're super excited. Just with the planned thing. So it's right. not like if we rushed to the hospital in the middle of the night or anything. We had gone in, had, you know, grabbed some coffees in the morning. We're, we were excited. Happy, you know, excited. Yeah. You know, I got, you know, I got plenty of selfies of me that day, you know, sitting in the waiting room with my scrub. Yeah. My, my, my hair net, my little, the little shoes they give you. And so. So how was that moment in the room when they did not let you be involved in, in what's going on and you kind of just had to sit and play a guessing game? What? You know, I think for me personally, like, since I was so loopy, I don't have a lot of like, you know, memory of that first hour or two. Michelle you know, was so sad. I was, she just I was didn't upset. really know why. I didn't know. Was still right. pain meds. Right. Yeah, and I I was freaking out. So it was just like, <clears throat> they had moved me to, you know, our actual room, um, and they came in and they had him in the little, you know, incubator and hooked up to oxygen. And I mean, it wasn't even something like, I didn't get to hold him, you know, like that, none of that. That was probably was, That was, you know, the most difficult part is the fact that mm. It is, you know, you want to have that one-on-one -on -one contact that, you know, hold your baby. We just didn't get that. You don't ever think about the possibility of them going into the NICU or you leaving the hospital without them, you know? Right. So that was, that was really difficult. She oh my like gosh. As a C-section mom, I'm... <laughs> I'm shocked right now because our child was in the NICU, but he was he was down the hall. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I did not have to leave the building. So you left the building. You had surgery in the next day. Yes. Yeah. The next day. Too. Like, I, I needed to see I needed to see my son. So at this time, all you guys knew is he is having problems breathing and yes. nothing. That, that's basically and nothing it, else. Yeah. Right. We didn't find out about his brain conditions until we went to Kansas City, which was three and a half three weeks. Three and a half weeks. And they said that they sat us down and said, hey guys, you know, this is something our hospital can't, you know. Well, my sister in law, his sister was helping watch Talon, and then so were my sisters. Um, and that I think was kind of the hardest part because during that three weeks of being in the hospital of oh, the, the, the NICU, Talon wasn't allowed to go in because he was under under the age. So the only way he got to see his brother is through the windows on the outside um, when my sisters would bring him up there or Alan would have a day off at work. And mind you, this whole time, Alan's still having to work full time. So I'm staying at the Ronald McDonald house, you know, by myself or some nights I have Talon with me um, and Alan's coming up on his days off. And that's the only way that you know, Talon can see him. <laughs> when we finally got him to Kansas City, it was a week after we got him there that we found out that he had the two brain conditions, um, he, which is the polymicrogyra Poly and, and uh, heterotopia. Yes. So, so your brain has a shape to it, a certain size of these folds that go back all the way along the sides of front, on both sides of his brain, instead of having nice, even waves per se, he has lots of little cuts. Right. And then there's spaces, there's gaps where the light matter uh, of the brain did not migrate to right. the correct location in utero. So basically um, he's missing some of the pathways that you 
normally would have of it. And he, his brain is just not normal. If you look at the scans compared to his brain to a healthy brain, it's very different. But um, a lot of it is in the motor skills. A lot of it is with breathing, basic, function. you know, breathing function, heart function, right? Uh, you know, kidney function. All that stuff is controlled on that side of the brain. So that's why he has some of these other complications that he seemingly should not have. It's really a perfectly normal, healthy baby, but your brain controls everything. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They talked to us, they sat us down and they said, hey, we have two options for you. You guys can either get him, you know, with the trach or we can do the jaw distraction. It was yeah. very stressful um, waiting for that surgery. Alan had to work. So in that meeting that we had, Alan was actually on the phone. Like he was on a conference call with oh, us. Because yeah. uh, unfortunately during these times, bills don't stop coming, you know? So one right. of us had to keep working. And so Alan kept working. And after we made that decision, you know, the next day going in there and that night, you know, just knowing that I was gonna have to sit there and wait by myself, you know, while Griffin is getting that surgery. It was just really hard. Yeah, I was very much against it, you know. Yeah. I thought like, we're not doing that. Like, and there's no way because he had been on like a high flow nasal cannula. And I thought if he's getting by with that, we can just keep doing that to keep us. But you know, the doctors really, they did a great job of explaining to us that that's not going to be able to last forever. We can't keep doing it this way. Um, right. And so, and, 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 and it wasn't just that he needed a tracheostomy for to get air up and down. He, they, he wound up on the ventilator. Yeah. You know, and coming in and seeing the big blue hose hanging off and, and, and then like a machine breathing for him. I don't know. I felt like we lost him right there. I don't shy away from um, like gruesome stuff. Like it, it doesn't bother me too bad, you know, seeing like medical procedures and stuff. But this just there was something carnal about it. Seeing a tube hanging out of my kid's throat and then hearing that sound of that machine. <laughs> pushing the air in and out and I just it freaked me out and that was that was a really tough adjustment you know on a, on a newborn little 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 bitty, little bitty yeah. baby mainly like I said I think psychologically the ventilator was was the hardest part yeah I mean I'm just like man he's not breathing for himself like so we dove into research yes on everything yeah. that he had so like... we started doing research um and Basically, in this follow-up period after he got that surgery and was on the vent, he was basically stable, saying, like, if you want to go home, we're going to have to train you. Yeah. We have to train you on how to care for this, the wound site or the, the tracheostomy surgery. We have to teach you how to change a trick. We have to teach you what to do in emergency situations. How to perform CPR right. on a kid with the trach and these kind yeah. of things. So uh, while we were in the hospital, we had to do, like, a mandatory stay and take mm -hmm. these kind of classes, per se. Um, we were learning the new things. That's when we started kind of getting other, well, what happened was really, we had a really good nurse. It's absolutely amazing. She had like an intuition, like yeah. he was caring for Griffin overnight and he was doing these little like, I don't know how good it's gonna look on webcam, but basically like these little jerks like that. Something, something me and her didn't even yeah. really think anything of, but she caught on and she said, you know, I've heard of this or I've seen this somewhere. And so she started asking questions and that's how we went down the route of looking at neuro stuff. Mm -hmm. um, she's like, I think this is a type of seizure. She's like, this is some kind of seizure or something. So then she got neurology involved. But they right. didn't, they didn't listen this, to her. This was the first clue. Right. Like this one, she caught the, mo the movements yeah. and said, those aren't normal baby infant movements. Yeah. He had been in the hospital from September 16th to December 19th. Um, and then that's when he was able to come back home. The hospital would not allow us to take him if we didn't have home nursing. Boy, that was a So, and that one, we were just like, wait, what? What do you mean we can't take our child home? Like, we're completely capable of taking care of our child. Oh. The day after Christmas, he had these terrible episodes. I mean, just like all day long of seizing. So we wound up having to bring him to the ER. And then they brought him to Kansas City, and that's when they did an EEG, and they said, yes, he's having focal seizures. 
um, and it was a 30 minute EEG. So after they got control of those, they started him on some medicine and they sent him home. And that's what kind of started this whole thing with uh, our- The whole journey with epilepsy. The whole journey with is, epilepsy was I mean, that, at that moment. This would go on for right. a long time. They'd put, say, okay, let's try this other medication. Yeah. Um, and then we would do that. Yep. I would take videos of <clears throat> these episodes that he was having. Um, and I am going to say, like, one of the mom groups that I'm a part of, the, um, a trach site, the, I posted the video on there, and the, I had several moms reach out to me, and they were like, hey, this looks like infantile spasms. You need to get him to a children's hospital and tell them and show them these videos and, you know, say that you want them to do an overnight EEG. Um, and so on this last episode that he had, that last episode that he had, and he was in the hospital, Alan, I basically had to refuse to leave the hospital because they were going to discharge him. And like when we were in there, it's like he's having these all the time, you guys. Like, I was really angry he at was, this point. Right. Like, we, we had gone in, we had gotten an hour long EEG. Yeah. They saw one tonic clonic seizure and they go, okay, seven tonic clonic seizures, which I know we're throwing a lot of terms at you and stuff, but just, just bear with us. So they say, oh, he's having this certain type of seizure. And they're like, you know, we're gonna adjust this medication and get you guys out of here. Yeah. And I said, we're not leaving this hospital until you right. tell me what the hell is going on with my son. You know, um, I was like, we suspect that it's this. We said, we suspect that it's infantile spasms. Yeah. Um, and I will say, this is probably one of the only times that I will give any praise to social media. Th that is one of the best benefits of it to humanity is the fact that we were able to crowdsource this information yeah. She was able to put that video on that trait group website where there was lots of moms with special needs kids and they were able to watch and instantly go hey i think it's a super rare thing that yeah. you don't see every day and a lot of doctors probably won't even know what it is and so sure enough that's exactly what it was i make a scene i tell them i'm not leaving here you're gonna have to drag security in here to get me right. out of this room we have his now diagnosis of infantile spasms. Do you guys feel like God allowed you guys to move and you had no clue this was happening to be placed? Oh, for sure, for sure. Right I think that, I mean, we were meant to be in Kansas and be at this hospital and have the people in our lives that we have in our lives, the nursing company, you know, and everything. I mean, that's a grander question. Um, I mean, God has a plan. Right. For everyone, not to get in my all my background, but I don't have no real like living relatives, so there's not like me, ma, papa, nothing like that. You know, what I mean, it's just it's just always been us, right? So we were very much alone in this whole thing throughout the whole process, and we had to cope. I had to mature really fast because I was acting a fool that <laughs> year. <laughs> hey, that's good that you're admitting it. Most men don't. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that was a blessing in our life too. Yeah, you know, Griffin helped change my life for the better. One hundred percent. Like, he I mean, made me he, put, he made me put eyes onto God. Yes. And at, and start asking questions. Yeah. And start, you know, I don't know. I went from being a, a, a immature child <laughs> to, to a grown He's man. He's trying to think so. of the word. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so during this time, you know, we are trying all kinds of different medications with Griffin. Dr. Ilias is like, hey, let's try this, this, and this, you know, and we thought there for about eight months that we finally had this under control, right? Like we hadn't seen any seizures, spasms, nothing. Like we had a great, you know, eight to 10 months. And then man, just out of nowhere, we see that, you know, that jerk and we're just like, wait, no. was, that, was that what we thought it was? Yeah. And please God, no. Yes. Basically what we were saying. So we were back on that. We this have tried. This gets really hard and heavy right. again because, like, we had gone through this period of growth, and we thought, okay, you know what? He's not going to have a total he normal was, life. He was doing really good, yeah. you know. Um, but there, we saw a path forward to like right. a pretty good life. We actually believed that we had a chance at nor like a semi-normal life. Yeah. He, of course, he was going to have learning disability and probably speech issues and mm -hmm. multiple issues, but he was going to be able to be like present with us, feel emotion, happy, right. sad, mad, whatever, you know, at least be like conscious of the fact that he's in the world with us. 
but unfortunately we started back with like, uh, with the seizures. the seizures you know he's like look kids with this typically don't make it till double digits to, into the double digits and that was kind of that was like a really big shock for us yeah you know because we asked him like i i just i actually straight just asked our doctor like what what is our lifespan for griffin if this right. continues you know, because I have to prepare. I feel like I need to prepare myself for that. You know, yeah. I need to know, like, what what our future, what his future looks like. We still are. You know, and it is, when he said that, I said, okay. I was shocked, but at the same time, I was like, 10 years. If, he, if, it, if we can get 10 years with him, like, maybe we can get more. You know, just, just if we can make it past that, you know. And unfortunately, you know... Now we're just kind of at that stage. Yeah, you fast, know, forward. fast forward. We are at that stage of after all these medications, after the VNS surgery, after, you know, jet, heart surgery. Heart surgery, open heart surgery. That was another one. Like he had yeah. open heart surgery because he had several holes in his heart, you know, and we're doing everything that we can to make sure that he's having this best life and he's able to, you know, continue to grow and meet these inch stones. You know, because a lot of people say milestones, but with, with Griffin, we always did inch stones, you know, just the little things, the smiles, the lifting of the head, the, you know, things like that. Like we praised everything, you know, so it was, it was just really hard. We just, unfortunately with Griff, Griffin's story is that he, he is not going to overcome epilepsy. It, right. It's going to take his life. We were recently informed that expect three to six three to nine months, months left with him left and we a month has passed since then so we're we're at the end now which is it's very difficult to do you know right now we're just trying to have fun we would like to have that boost to be able to go and do some stuff with our son before it's kind of like him. you know like our bucket list with Griffin yeah I want to get I want to you know we want to be able to go like we, we got a camper for Griffin for Make-A-Wish. Make-A-Wish gave us a camper. I'd like to be able to take the thing out. We need to get it tagged. Um, we want to be so, able to just make trips with him. Yeah, we want to go camping. We want to go see the sites. I want to be able to take time off work and be at home a little bit more. I kind of felt like we lost this last <laughs> year. Like, yeah. I was mad. Like, I was really upset. Like, they told us Griffin's having over 400 seizures a day. Yeah. I can't even fat like I like I couldn't even wrap my head around the fact that he's having four hundred seizures a day. Twenty an 18, hour. Yeah, eighteen to twenty an hour. I mean, and that's just like when he's sleeping, when he's awake, when I mean like so I was just kinda like in shock, like when they when they said that. Like I didn't even know and I still don't even know how to like really handle that, you know, because I at least thought at one point when he was sleeping, I thought that, you know, he got that like that break. It's but been a hard life for little Griffin. It's been very difficult for him. And you guys. I mean, this is, that's hard. It is. It's, um, it's like numbing a bit, you know? Mm -hmm. It's very easy to get into like a negative thought cycle and want to shut down. Um, uh, particularly someone like both of us had pretty, um, it's, but we had traumatic childhoods. We had, you know, my parents weren't around at all. I grew up in the system from five you know a lot of group homes and stuff she actually did the same thing she eventually you know was eventually adopted so without going to deep in there so we have like sorted kind of childhood kid stories it just feels like a double whammy some days where it's like you grow up in that and then you then you get into your own adult life and you you put the crap behind you and then you get hit with something like this which is completely out of anyone's control there's nothing we did you know michelle god for a while there she would like what did I do wrong? Is it because I, you know, went to that party and drank a cigarette or did this and that? And I'm like, 
No, in which before I found out it was pregnant, right, mind you. you. Like, like that was early, early on. And I'm like, no, that's not what happened here. You know, she did. We did everything we were supposed to do. She did everything she's supposed to do. She was completely responsible, eating right, taking her vitamins, what you know, doing the light exercise, the walking. You know, stay. She was really on it. And but it's hard. She still uh, blamed herself. It's just difficult because you try to find a reason on why and how this happened, you know, like, what could I have done differently? Is there anything that I could have done differently? And I know, I mean, I do know that there isn't anything that I could have done differently. It's, it's genetic, you know, for him. And it's just hard, you know, we didn't want to tell Talon or Natalia about this timeline that we had with Griffin because we didn't know how they were going to react, but I mean, we were going to tell them. We just Eventually, hadn't figured we just it had, out. We hadn't had to figure out how to set our kids down right. and explain something like this. And to Talon, them. about a week ago, just came out and asked me. He said, Mom, he said, is Griffin going to die? And I didn't I didn't want to lie to him. I didn't want to be like, oh, no, but everything's OK. Like, because I think he senses and, you know, that things are kind of different as well. And. I told him, you know, yes, I said he's going to. Um, I said, but we don't know when. Um, but it'll it's eventually going to happen, you know. And he, you know, he was like really upset. And he was just like, Mom, he said, well, can't God fix him? You know, and it's hard to answer that because I want to be, you know, I told him, I said, yes, I said, he can't. I said, but, you know, everybody has a certain amount of time on earth like and you know griffin's is not going to be as long as everybody's i said but eventually we will all be you know back together again you know we'll see each other in heaven um and he just told me he said mom he said you know griffin's special like he like god can fix him because he's special and i was like well he's so special you know that God is going to want him with him, mm -hmm. you know? So he was like, okay, mom, he's like, this is too sad to talk about. Like he just, so he understands, you know, he's seven years old. He understands, but you we don't want to have that. We haven't approached the subject with our, our, our four-year-old four -year Natalia. So like, I'm not even, I'm not looking forward to that at all. So we just want to be able to have more family time together. We want to be able to have, you know, Griffin have more outings with Talon and Natalia and, you know, for them to have those memories of him not just being at home or in the hospital. Like the only time we go out is when we're in Kansas City and Griffin's in the hospital. You know, we want to be able to make these memories and for them to have grand. these memories. We're going to have like one last grand thing to go do, a camping trip with the whole family, go see the sites. We That's really get, what we want right. to do. We want to get wanna, family pictures together. Yeah, we like want to go get pictures. Families. We want to we want to load the camper up and take it to a national park or something and just get out of society for a little bit with our kid and and just enjoy him, enjoy nature, um, kind of reconnect with the earth, you know, while we're going through this thing. As sad as it is, as, as sad as it is, and whatever time that we have left with him, I wouldn't have it any other. Now, frankly. Like, if, if, if he could live, right. if we had a cure. There's things we can do, but it, we just don't have the time. We're in a time crunch. I don't have time to save for a year to do a big family trip, you know? I gotta, right. I wanna go yeah. do it now well, while we have time. He actually said, I love you. I've yeah, never- it's crazy. I've never heard him. Oh my gosh. Do that. I love you. I love you. Like, and I had to like go back, you know, and look at the camera and really kind of be like, did he really just say that? Because I was telling him that I love him. I was hanging out with him on the couch, and he said it. And, I mean, I was, I was just like in shock. Like, you can hear me in the video, just like gasp, like, oh my goodness, did he really just say that? You know, so like, is it moments like that where you just like, I don't know. Like, I've, I felt. So lucky to hear that, you know, because I hadn't, I've never heard him because he doesn't talk. He's nonverbal. We just want to get as much positive memories out of this last bit of time we have, you know, 